we're going to talk about something that is not easy because unfortunately in our uh, generation and in our day of age everybody has something to deal with and uh, there's not one house in the nation of Israel and even in the entire planet that doesn't have something to deal with and I mentioned that so many times Baruch Hashem we're, we're, we're very very popular online winning many many videos all over the place and worldwide uh, uh, outreach programs so as a result from that we have thousands and thousands of followers as a result from that then we get on a daily basis thousands and thousands of emails and emails whatsapp messages social media it's pouring in and in quantities that are just growing and growing and unfortunately uh, from the thousands of the messages that we get I never get a message of somebody telling me by the way I just wanted to tell you everything is good <laughs> and I just wanted to report that things are fine 99.999 <laughs> if not a hundred percent of the messages are horror stories of problems and chaos and difficulties and people are looking for a, for an answer looking for guidance looking for hope and many times people come and, and tell me their problems and complain I always tell tell my wife I must look like a wall and she, in the beginning she didn't understand my joke she's like why do you think you look like a wall so I said because everybody comes and whispers to me their problems you know everybody goes to the Kotel to the Wailing Wall in Israel they whisper the problems this is probably look like a wall everybody comes and tells me their problems so unfortunately everybody has something to deal with and uh, in many cases when people tell me about their problems my answer I don't have answers I don't have a, a magic uh, book with answers but many people, I just tell them, how about you come and sit next to me every day from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. my time. I spend time on the phone and I take calls and I listen to people. Once I had time, then the calls were long. Now that I don't have time, then the calls are short because we want to try to squeeze in as many people as possible. And my, my, my advice is come and sit with me for one hour, two hours, three hours every day, listen to the phone calls you're going to realize you don't have problems you're going to realize you are doing pretty pretty good sometimes my wife my wife will pass through the room she was like how can you listen to this all day long <laughs> six hours five hours seven hours every day just to listen to the problems of the world so the answer that i give her and that's the answer that i give many people not too long ago we have Baruch Hashem in Tzfat, a very beautiful center for ladies, for mature ladies that they want to learn Torah. I don't like using the word older ladies because it's not nice, but our oldest student, she's 79 years old. <coughs> and we have a, a lot of ladies come from all around the world. A lot of them are in the 60s, 50s, 70s, 40s. I mean, we have some young ones in the 40s. But uh, ladies who want to learn Torah, they don't have where to learn Torah. So, Baruch Hashem, this is a beautiful center where they can come and learn Torah. So, we deal with a lot, a lot of women. One time, a few months ago, a young lady, it was not so young, but young, I'm saying, and, and compared to the rest of the ladies, she came knocking on our door, one o'clock in the morning, banging on the door. And her husband, unfortunately, was uh, beating her up. And she came running with a baby looking for a place to, to, to hide and of course very quickly the police came and the whole house was uh, surrounded with police cars and the whole house is up and the husband is on the other line on the call threatening and a whole, a whole thing going on and of course this doesn't, uh, first of all doesn't look so good what's going on, why is the police in the middle of the night in the rabbi's house <laughs> and then of course in the middle of the night everybody's up and it wasn't a nice scene for a couple hours and the husband was getting very very aggressive and at some point already it was three in the morning four in the morning and she didn't have where to go she slept she, she stayed by us on the couch to sleep 
And of course, my wife and me were up all night. So in the morning, my whole schedule was uh, changed. So I had a meeting in the morning and I called the person. I said, I have to push the meeting off uh, uh, for a different hour. Okay, when we met later on, he told me, why did you have to delay the meeting? So I told him in one sentence, a young lady came. We had, we had this whole issue and I gave him uh, a little bit of details. She was up all night, we were up all night, the police were there. The, the husband was calling me and threatening me and there was a whole issue there. So he looked at me like, doesn't it bother you to, to deal with this? A woman coming to your house in the middle of the night and, and uh, sleeping on your couch and the whole house is up and says, yeah, you have to deal now with the police and the husband and doesn't it bother you? So I told him I'd rather deal with other people's problems than my problems. Because when I deal with other people's problems, then God deals with my problems. So that's the answer I always give to my wife when she tells me, how do you deal with this when you hear this all day long? And I tell her, because I'd rather deal with somebody else's problems and not with my problems. When it's far away from home, well, I don't care. A little splinter in your neshama, ooh, this is uh, the biggest problem in the world. When somebody else has the same problem, okay, no, it's, it's out of the house. It's nothing to do with me. So, the sad reality is that we all have many, many problems. I'll tell you what's the problem, is that we think it's a problem. We don't have problems. We make an issue out of situations that in many cases has nothing to do with me. So we make them out to be problems. And before I even start, it's important that I, 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 I explain that I'm not minimizing anybody's problems. A lot of times people misinterpret what I say and they say, why are you minimizing other people's problems? And I'm not minimizing anybody's problems. I know people are struggling with severe things, whether it's in the health department, in the finance department, in marital department. I am not minimizing anybody's problems. And I can relate with most of their problems because most of the things I dealt with it one way or another in my, in my short span of life. I'm, I mean, I'm not young, but I'm definitely not old. And the sad reality is that everybody's dealing with something. We're going to start removing now from tonight the word a problem. We're rather going to use, we have to deal with situations. So first of all, and most important to understand that we deal with all sorts of difficulties Mainly because right now, it's minutes, maybe hours, chas v'shalom, maybe days or weeks before Mashiach is coming. So the string around our throat is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Only because the Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to already scream to stop it. I had enough. So one way or another, the redemption is coming. I know many people, when you talk about the concept of Mashiach and redemption, ah, ah, we heard about that already. Give me something else. But that's the reality. And many people, of course, say, oh, but we've been hearing about it for so long. Everybody keeps saying that. All the generations, they were saying, Mashiach is coming, Mashiach is coming. Also for the ones who are standing in the lines in the gas chambers, they told them Mashiach is coming. So why is he going to come now? So tonight we're not going to talk about why Mashiach is coming or how do we know Mashiach is coming. I have enough le lectures online that you can uh, get all the information. We have a brand new CD now that came out. It's fresh out of the oven. That uh, I came here, you can take it. It has 30 hours of information about the coming of Mashiach. I'm saying fresh out of the oven. I print my CDs in Israel. And when I come here, I come with empty suitcases. I fill them up with CDs. And when I come back, I have empty suitcases. So my wife has an Amazon Prime account. And she makes sure that I come back with full suitcases. <laughs> so I'm like the number one dad in the world. My kids barely see me. They barely know how I look. But I come home with packed suitcases. Aww. So I don't even know what I'm getting. They think that I'm getting it. And sometimes they call me, did you get the blue one or the red one? Oh. And I'm like, uh, it's a surprise. <laughs> it's a surprise. No, 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 tell me, did you get the blue one? No, no. Tell them it's a surprise. I don't even know what they got. Tell my wife, what did I get? What, what, what am I bringing? So, <laughs> so, the funniest thing is that 
I left uh, Eretz Israel this Sunday morning, and the person who's printing my CDs, he met me in the airport, because everything is done last minute, everything is rushed, everything is like, uh, I work 25 hours a day, and then there's not enough time to do anything. So he met me at the airport. Just imagine the scene, me standing there in the drop-off area of the passenger area with empty suitcases, a car stops, somebody comes out of the car, opens the car, takes a boxes. I give him something into his hand, he gives me something, and we put, him in the, put the boxes in the suitcases. I was like, if, they, if customs are now looking from their cameras, what's going on here? That doesn't look so good. A guy with a long beard, like, <laughs> putting boxes in suitcases. So, anyways, so we have a fresh CD came out of the oven, you can smell the ink on it, but it has 30 hours about the topic of Mashiach, how, why, and all the information we need to know why we, Mashiach is coming any second. So I know for many people that's not a good answer to tell them, well, we have issues because Mashiach is coming and God wants us to scream already that we want the redemption. But that's not soothing to the ear when somebody says, that, that's, uh, I don't buy that. When Mashiach is going to come, I'll be very, very happy. But as an intro, I'm saying that the reason why we're dealing with many, many, many different challenges is because the time is for the redemption to come. And God wants us to be ready for that. And based on all the sources that we have and the information that we have, Mashiach should have been here already a long time ago. And it's an enigma why Mashiach is not here. My theory is that God just wants to give us another day and another day and another day to do our, our tshuva, another opportunity to do tshuva. And not to come to a point that Mashiach comes and I didn't do my tshuva. But... Tonight I want to talk a little bit about something different because the point is when, when a person is going through a challenge then they need some type of a, a string to hold on because the hardest thing in, in, in doing while you're facing a challenge is where do you hold your hopes on? I mean something, you have to hold on something. And the challenges that we have this is something that is very hard to understand, but the challenges that we have are just for our benefit. If you analyze every challenge that you went through in your life and you look at it back, you'll see that the challenge actually birthed something good. Just as we're going through the challenge, it's very hard to, de to deal with it. But look at your own record and you'll see that most of the challenges, difficulties and problems that you dealt with at the end of the day, after that, it actually had a good outcome. And it took you to somewhere better. And it had to go through, through a certain process in order to reach to that place. And tonight I don't want to talk about why we have challenges. Because, you know, this is one of the questions that I, there's no answers to. There are two questions that I really don't like when people ask. It's why and what if. Because it's questions you're never going to get answers to. So many people say, but why? I don't know why. Nobody knows why. The only one who knows why is God, and He's not going to tell you why. So why try to get an answer when you're not going to get an answer? Why is it happening to me? Well, file a complaint with the Master of the Universe. Maybe He'll send you an email telling you why. The point is not to ask why. Why? Because you're not going to get an answer. So why bother why? Rather, ask yourself, what do I need to do? What can I learn from that? What is the best thing to do now to deal with it? So why we, we remove this question out of, the, out of the equation? And what if? What if is, excuse my language, it's the most stupidest question to ask. What if? My three-year-old asks this question. Sometimes I hear my three-year-old talk to my five-year-old, and she tells her, what if we had the keys to the candy store? We could have all the candy in the world. So the other one says, no, 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 not all the candies in the world is in that candy store. There's other candy stores. <laughs> but what if we had the keys to all of them? <laughs> and then now you hear the conversation and you're like, okay, that's a conversation of a three-year-old talking to a five-year-old. What if? Because for them has this option, what if? But for us, we're more mature and there's not what if. What if is a living in fantasy? And if a person lives in fantasy when it comes to deals, deal with reality, then there's a serious problem. Because you're putting your hopes on a fantasy and not on a reality. And when I'm dealing with a situation, I need to deal with the reality, not with false hope. 
So the question why and the question what if, just you got to move it out of, out, of, out, of the, out of the, even an option. Tonight I don't want to focus about why we have challenges. Because the challenges, I can tell you in a few words what they are, the challenges are a ladder for us to step to a higher level. That's what it is. God constantly wants you to grow spiritually, emotionally, and physically. If you come to this world and you're in the same place where you started, then why did you come to this world? Yesterday, we had a lecture, and the day before that, we had another lecture where I, I presented a question that anybody needs to ask themselves at least once a day is what am I doing here in this world? What is the purpose of me being on this planet? To live for 80 years in order to support a, a bank for 40 years and pay a mortgage? And for wh wh what am I here in this uh, world? To, to live from another paycheck to another paycheck and hope and wait for the annual vacation that I'm going to take? Well, I, I have a purpose in this world. Any person needs to ask himself every day, what is the purpose that God created me? Now, if you don't have an answer to this question, that's a problem. That's a problem you need to deal with. Everything else is God's problems. You need to figure out what is your purpose in this world. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose in this world, then you have to find what is the purpose. Now, when I go and search for my purpose, then I figure out that the purpose is not one thing. It's not that I came here just to do one thing. I came to do here many things. And the purpose will go in stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three. And you can't jump stages. You have to go through all the stages, one after the other. You know where you see it very, very clearly? In a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating Pesach. And most people, they dread Pesach. You tell them a word, Pesach, oh, no, no, start cleaning the house. The thing is, with Pesach, we're not here to clean the house. Pesach is about cleaning myself, not cleaning the house. The house is more symbolic, and of course, you can have chametz in the house. But the cleaning of Pesach is cleaning my own junk. All my ego and my pride and all my issues is getting rid of it. But why am I mentioning Pesach, besides that it's around the corner? Is that the night of Pesach, we have a certain ceremony. And in Hebrew, and I'm sure also in English they call it, they call it Seder Pesach. Or Lel Seder. Seder is order. That's what it means. And why do we call it the night of order? Should have been called the night of Matzot. Lel HaMatzot. Or the night of freedom. Lel HaChofesh. Why you call it Lel Seder? The night of order. It's because you have to go through a certain order. First, Kadesh. Then, Chatz. Right? Karpas. Yachatz. There's an order. If you switch the order, you mess the whole thing up. Now, Pesach is such a powerful time that it's actually the time of the year where we can go out of our own limitations. This is not something I wanted to talk about tonight, but it's important to know because when we relate with the holiday of Pesach, we remember, oh, you know, 3,400 years ago we were slaves in Egypt. And then came this guy with a long beard, Moishele, and he did some hocus pocus, and then he got us all out of Mitzrayim. And since then we eat matzah. But the reality that Pesach is the reality that we have right now. Nothing changed from now and from the time of Egypt. Then we were slaves, and we're also now slaves. Some people are slaves to their job, some people are slaves to their car, some people are slaves to their phone, and some people are slaves to the issues that they need to deal with. Instead of putting it in the back burner and saying, it's not my problem to deal with even. Why do I have to be so OCD on my own problems that's a type of slavery. Pesach is the time that the reason why we celebrate Pesach is not because we want to commemorate the fact that we left Egypt 3,400 years ago. Rather, on that night, on the 14th day of Nisan, a very special godly light came down to the world and permeated the power for every person in every generation to go out of their own limitations. Because the word Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim I, I, I know is the name of the country, Egypt. But Mitzrayim comes from the word in Hebrew, Metzarim, limitations. And when I go out of my limitations, this is called Yetziat Mitzrayim. I went out of my limitations. And sometimes my limitations is to deal with something in this world that is driving me crazy. That I can't fall asleep because of that. It's making me nauseous. I'm worried. I have anxiety. What's going to happen? What am I going to do? And 
That's a type of limitation. Instead of letting the nature of the universe take care of itself. Why do I have to worry about it? Worry will not get you anywhere. Worry is actually a, a, a sign that you have zero lack of faith and trust in Hashem. Because you know how you say worry in Hebrew? De'aga. When a person is worried, who do'eg. Now if you're looking at the letters in Hebrew de, of the word de'aga, it has the letter Aleph, then it has the letter Gimel, then it has the letter Dalet, the letter He, it goes in order. But it's missing one letter in the order, and that's the letter Bet. And Bet stands for the word in Hebrew, Bitachon, trust. When you trust Hashem. So if I worry for any type of reason, for anything, it means I have zero trust in God. But God can't pay the, the bill. God cannot solve the problem like that. If I have 100% trust in Hashem, then I know that everything that Hashem does is for my own good. He brought the problem, he'll take the problem. The more that I feed on the problem, then I more separate myself from Hashem, and then the problem doesn't get solved. Because Hashem says, oh, you think you can solve it? Here, let's see. Let's see what you can do. But if you say to Hashem, this is your problem, this is not my problem, then you see that Hashem takes your problems away. I'll give you one example out of many before we continue is that, Baruch Hashem, I didn't ask for that, and I, I didn't even search or want to do that, but it happened to be that four years ago I moved to Eretz Israel, and very quickly after that, in a pace that I, I, I can't even stand my own pace, very quickly we opened the women's center, very quickly after that a men's yeshiva, very quickly after that a shul, very quickly after that so many different programs, then Baruch Hashem, I see it as a zchut, it's a great merit, but needless to say, that's requiring me to work 28 hours a day, and four hours I'm, I'm borrowing. I don't know from where, but, but I'm borrowing. But with all these great things that we do, then of course comes a massive financial burden. In the beginning, for many years, I had my art re outreach organization. It wasn't uh, so expensive to run. Now when you have a big school, that's expensive. You have a yeshiva, that's expensive. You have a shul, that's expensive. And we have many, many huge programs. We have a huge food bank. We're feeding hundreds of families every week and so many different things. But there's a huge financial burden for that. Okay, so when I come to the, to the United States and Europe, when I go on my trips, I go to inspire, to teach, to talk, to meet people. But that's an opportunity to also fund the organization. That's how it works. You know, it's not, we didn't invent that. 2,000 years ago, also the Tanaim used to have to go and, go and fundraise. It's the part that I hate the most, but it's part of the job. Okay. Last year, then I, I came to one of the trips, and it, the, there was the spiritual part of the trip, and there was the physical, the financial part of the trip. And I had my goals, I had all the plans all set up. And uh, I had my, my budget that I need to come back with. The first day we had a lecture, second day, third day, every day we had a lecture. The first day of the first lecture, finishing the lecture, usually we come, you see, with a big table with CDs and books and uh, all sorts of uh, souvenirs. And happened to be that my daughter was with me also on that trip. Comes the end of the first lecture and I don't know, how was uh, the first night? Was Horrible. We made $78. $78. That's not even covering the gas to come here. The second night, the third night, every night was exactly like that. Was, money was not coming in. I'm starting to, to hyperventilate. Oh my God, I mean, I need to at least cover the ticket. I need to cover the expenses, but I have to I have uh, thousands of people depending on me. And I'm starting to wor worry, which I don't worry, but it's starting to bother me. And I see how it's on a, hanging like a burden. What am I going to do? Where am I going to get the money? Maybe I'll call this guy. Maybe I'll call this guy. What am I going to do? Instead of me doing my purpose, I'm worrying about where am I going to get money. At some point after a couple of days, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I, I don't worry. I don't let problems affect me. And I made a switch in my mind and I said, wait a minute, my job, I'm not the treasurer of the organization. My job is not to bring money. You know what my job in the organization is? To come and teach. My job is to come and inspire other people. My job is to come and sit and to give advice or to inspire or to talk and to meet people. I didn't come here today. It's not my problem. And I told God, you know, I don't know what you want from me. This is not my problem. This is your problem. This is your organization. It's your yeshiva. I'm just a teacher there. And the second that I made a switch in my mind, I was like, this has nothing to do with me. 
if the, the burden, the finance burden is sitting on my mind and I can't teach the class right, then I didn't do my part. The night that I made the switch, then I came to another lecture, and at the end of the lecture, somebody approached me and he told me, can I ask you a question? That's how it always starts. Can I ask you a question? I have a small question. When I hear small question, oh, okay, get comfortable. So, so he tells me, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course you can ask me a question. So we sat and we talked and we talked and we talked. It was a very small question. Around 4 o'clock in the morning, my daughter was already sleeping in the backseat of the car. But uh, at the end of the night, after we had a whole night, we spoke and Baruch Hashem, I was able to find the right answers and to give him the right tools and he felt very inspired and very uh, uh, happy about the whole thing. Okay, comes the end of the night, I turn around, I'm about to go and he tells me one more thing and he pulls out and he gives me an envelope. And I'm like, okay, thank you so much. I mean, I know it's not an invitation to the Yankees uh, 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 ball game. I knew it's a check. Okay, I thanked him and I went to the car. You would think that I would rip the envelope open, right? The envelope is sitting on the dashboard and I'm like looking at the envelope. Should I open? Should I not open? Ah, you know, it's probably like a 36 Pamaim Chai, something that will make me very uh, not happy. Or like sometimes the numbers are like not equal numbers, 101.2. So I was like, you know, just, just, I don't care. I really don't care. Three days passed. My daughter's telling me, open the envelope. I'm like, I can't open it. I don't want to open it. And when I finally, after three days, I opened the envelope, it was a very large amount that covered probably all the budget that I was looking to, to, to get. And I was like, look at that. I could have sat and worried and worried and worried. And instead of focusing on what I need to focus, focus on a problem that I have zero control about it. And I was almost about to lose the opportunity. Why did I come here? I think I came here to, to shop. I'm joking with the Amazon. I'm not joking. I actually bring stuff. But I didn't come here to shop. Before I leave on my trips, I go every six, week on, on six weeks on a trip. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for my wife and definitely not easy for my kids. But I have a, a goal. And when I'm focused on what I need to do, then everything else, it's not my problem. And I like giving my problems to God because it's His problems. This is not my problem. I don't need to worry about certain things because it's nothing to do with me. I have a, a, a list of problems that I need to deal with. I need to wake up in the morning and pray. I need to make sure that I educate my kids in the right path. I myself, me myself, I have a, a, a job. I need to come and teach now. I need to come and talk to people. Yes, even with those short questions, I know it's sometimes it's not so convenient at 3 o'clock in the morning to hear, I have a short question. Yesterday night, we finished the lecture, 1.30 in the morning, we're standing outside, freezing cold. A lady says, I have a short question. I'm like, oh, okay, do you have maybe a long coat? Because, uh, so, but this is my job. My job is not to worry about things that has nothing to do with me. And the second that I leave these responsibilities that has nothing to do with me, to God to worry about, let him burn, let him worry about it. Don't worry, God has all the resources for everything. I don't need to find answers for him. And I have to understand that I have zero control about most of the things that are in my life. Most people, they're running after the tail worrying about where they're going to get the next my uh, paycheck to, to pay the mortgage. How am I going to cover the bills? How am I going to do this? We have zero control. When you realize that you have zero control in your life, then you let God deal with the problem. I have other problems. My problem is to do what God wants me to do. Not to worry about things that has nothing to do with me. So, why we have problems, challenges, difficulties, and so forth, don't try to ask why. You'll never get an answer. Most people, when they go through a challenge, right away, why me? And if you think you're going to get an answer, you're wrong. You're not going to get an answer. There's no point. Move, move, on, move on. You're not going to get an answer. Don't ask why me. And the question you need to ask is, okay, what do I need to do right now? Now, the problem is, especially what I want to talk about tonight, is not why we have challenges. This is irrelevant. Is how do I deal with a challenge, or more to say, because I told you to deal with a challenge, let God deal with it. How do I stay at least happy? Because the problem with most people is that any type of challenge that comes into their life, 
right away the gauge of happiness goes down. And that's the problem. If you lose joy, happiness, and, and, and it's affecting you in a way because of a certain challenge, that's where you lost. The challenge is going to be there whether you want it or not. The challenge is going to be taken care of whether you want it or not. Of course, you have to do your part. I mean, we can't uh, negate the fact that many of the problems that we deal with, we cook it for our own, we do it for ourselves. This is uh, not something that we need to, to mention and to talk too much about it, but it's important to know that many of the problems that I deal with in this world, I cooked it. And that's why our sages explain in the Talmud, Habal Adam Yisurim, a person is experiencing hardship and suffering, Yefashpesh Bemasav, go through your actions, because maybe you did something wrong. If I have a financial burden suddenly comes, I'm sure everybody experienced one time or another, suddenly a chas a car accident, the boiler explodes, the roof collapses. Why is now there? Why are you getting me now problem this? Where am I going to find all the money to pay for that? So, in a case like this, in any case, then a person has to go through their actions. Maybe I did something. Because maybe I stole something, maybe I took something wrongfully and it's not really mine. Maybe I, do, I did something in the finance department that I'm getting it back like a boomerang. Because the, the way this world works, many people think that God is a mean tyrant and he punishes us for every sneeze that we do. The reality is, is that God created the world with a set of rules and he said, these are the rules. The rules are placed in the book called the Torah, because how do we know it's the set of rules? And it's placed in the Torah, because the word Torah comes from the word in Hebrew, Hora'ah, teaching. This is the manual. And God says, don't eat this animal, don't do this action, don't do this and don't do that. Why? Because it's going to cause a problem. When I go over and I do something against the rules, then what happens is that I do a foolish action and I get a reaction. So it's not that God is necessarily punishing me for everything that I do. Rather, God told me, these are the rules of the universe. If you follow the rules, things will be fine. Don't follow the rules, you're going to have to deal with the reaction. So I like calling it an action and a reaction. If you now go and bang your head at the wall, then it's going to be a reaction to that. You know what's going to be the reaction? You're going to have a headache. Well, are you going to blame the wall? Why are you there? You're going to blame your head? No, you made a foolish action. action. No, you're going to deal with a bad reaction. So I'm sure you, when you have little kids, you educate them. Don't put your hand in the socket because you're going to chas v'shalom get electrocuted. There's going to be a bad reaction. Don't do this and don't do that. Don't drive 110 miles an hour because you know why? If you're lucky, a cop will stop you. If you're not lucky, you'll go into a car accident. Now, is that a punishment? No, it's a reaction of your own foolish action. Very simple. So I have to understand that many of the problems that I deal with, I cooked it. I brought it on myself. Therefore, that the first aid is that I have to look what's, what's the action that I'm dealing with. And if I can pinpoint on an action that I did, then good, then I know what to do to vine. And usually the reaction will come in the same department of the action. So if I get a ticket, or chas v'shalom, any some type of a financial stress right now, then I have to say, wait a minute, maybe I owe somebody money. Maybe I stole something deliberately, not knowingly. There's a, a big part in the department of theft that is called gezel. Gezel means that I take something that doesn't belong to me and it's not, nearly, not necessarily theft. Theft, it means that I came through the window in the middle of the night and I stole something. But gezel, I'll give you an example because we had a few classes in our, in our uh, seminary about gezel. And I gave many different examples. And for example, one lady asked me and she told me one day we were going on a trip and we stopped in like a 7-Eleven to buy some water. But I knew that the next day I'm going to do a barbecue. So I took these little bags of ketchup because they have the hot dogs there in 7-Eleven. I took a few bags of ketchup. So I told her, that is guessing. Now you are liable because you took a 10 cent bag. Who told you you can take it? How many times people go into a restaurant, they take a bunch of tissues. They're not even sitting in the restaurant. Or you go to a hotel, you, take, you go home with the shampoos. Now, if the hotel told you whatever's in the room you can take, or you ask the front desk, can I take these sample shampoos? And they tell you, yes, go ahead and take it. But if they tell you no, or you didn't ask, that's gazelle. That's worse than stealing. So, so many times we do gazelle, 
And we're like, ah, or we don't even notice. And then the Kadosh Baruch will send us a red light beeping, like when you drive in your car and you're running out of gas and the light goes out. Hashem also will give you a red light. Listen, you did something. So first reaction is that you have to check. Maybe I did something wrong. And if chas v'shalom, I see uh, 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 that the reaction is in the health department, well, maybe I hurt somebody. Maybe I insulted somebody in front of a lot of people. Maybe I hurt somebody's feelings. Maybe somebody needed my help and I didn't help them. So there's always going to be connected. Now, if you go through your actions and you see that you're 100% fine, then good. Then you move to next stage. But if you see on yourself, wait a minute, I did something wrong, then in many cases, the challenge, the problem that you're dealing with is a reaction of something that you did. That's, first of all, it's important to know. But again, I don't want to sidetrack too much. To, now I more want to talk about the specific issue is that a person cannot remain happy while dealing with a challenge. The challenge is going to be there. The challenge is there to stay. The challenge is there for you to grow spiritually. Now, one of the main questions is, are you going to go through the challenge with a smile or not? This is where mainly what we want to talk about today. I always share a certain uh, example that when I go to sleep, I fall asleep within a millisecond. Uh, my head doesn't even touch the pillow. I'm already in my third dream. And my wife always complains, how do you fall asleep so fast? I sleep half an hour like this and half an hour like that and half an hour like this and then... And, it says, and she told me, how do you fall asleep so fast? I've never seen anybody fall asleep so fast. So my answer is, first of all, I only have two hours to sleep, so I have to take care of every minute here. But besides that, I have no worries. Nothing bothers me. I don't owe anybody anything. I don't have anything on my mind that bothers me. So time to go to sleep, eyes down, system is down. Most people don't fall asleep. Mine. Working over hours. How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? She said this about me. He said this about me. And then you occupy, and then for a whole hour you don't sleep. And then when you finally sleep, it's not a good sleep. Tossing and turning, and you're waking up all disturbed and not happy. And I always tell my, my wife, I make, a, I pull a partition. I don't take the problems with me. It's not my problem. Nothing is my problem. If it's bothering me so that I don't fall asleep, that is a problem. So I'm also human like all the other people. I also have bills to pay. People think that, I don't know, that like money is coming off the ceiling with me. I have six kids to support. They have tuition. They have to feed them. I have to close them. I also have all the issues of all other people. But I don't let the challenges in my life affect my own happiness. Because when I'm not happy and I'm sad and I'm depressed, I can't function. I'm not functioning. I'm not doing anything positive towards the problem that I'm dealing with. And I'm definitely not gaining my spiritual growth from the challenge that Hashem placed in front of me. You have to understand that the challenge is a step in the ladder of your spiritual growth. We came to this world to grow, constantly to grow from one level to another level and another level. You can't jump stages. You have to go in an order. So I told you before in Pesach, why is it called Seder? Because it has to be an order. You have to grow from one level to another level to another level to another level. Till you reach to your ultimate goal in this world, to your main purpose in this world. But it has to be one step after the other. And how do you climb up? Then Hashem will give you a ladder and that ladder will be a challenge in your life. Your trick right now is how do you stay happy while there's a challenge? I can guarantee to you, and I have a, a very long list of uh, uh, challenges in my past that I had to go through, serious, serious challenges. It's not that I'm coming and I'm throwing some theories. I can tell you it's all coming from my own personal experience, what I had to deal with. And when you don't remain happy or you keep your own uh, 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 mood the right way, then you're feeding the challenge. And when you completely ignore the challenge, the difficulty or whatever you deal with, and your attitude is positive, 50% of the challenge already wears off, if not most of it. And I see it as a proof. 
when you focus on the difficulty, I call it a challenge. And now the challenge is the general word for health problems or financial problems, marital problems. We're titling it now a challenge because it's a challenge. Whether you're going to learn from it, whether you're going to grow from it, or whether it's going to pull you down and it's going to cause a havoc. So the challenge is just a stepping stone to go a little bit higher. When you completely ignore it, not ignore it that you, if chas v'shalom, there's a health problem, saying, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking that you don't let it affect you. Then you see that most of the effect of it already wears off. Now, we have to understand that the real happiness is coming from deep within inside of me. The lack of happiness is not because I have now a financial problem or because I have a health problem or anything. That's not where the, the sadness or the happiness will come or not come. Sa happiness comes only from within. From the, within, I mean from our soul. Now, why are people not happy? Because they say, because I have the bank here bothering me. Or I have now to deal with a child that is very difficult. Or I have to deal now with a very bad marriage. Or I have to deal now with a sickness or whatever it is. That's what they'll answer you. But the reality is that people are not happy for one reason. Because something is missing. Not because they have a challenge. People are not happy because something is missing in their life. Now the question is, what's, not, what's missing? In our genera generation, we have an abundance of everything. You miss anything? Everybody has, everybody has from everything. So we want to ask, how do I get to a place that I am happy, even though life is hard? Life is hard, life was always hard, life will always will be hard. It's, it's, a, it's a myth that life is not hard. Because even if you have a 10-year good period and everything is good, there will be another, there will come a next period and it's not going to be so great. Sometimes Hashem gives you like these grace periods of things are calm. But life is not here for, uh, to be easy. Life is, by default, is hard. Now, most people are unhappy. Forget about that. Let's, we're going to put now the whole challenge aside because I want to talk about com something completely different because I want to get to a point that I'm naturally happy and then the difficulty in my life, okay, it's another, another thing that I need to, to take care of. It's like a bill. Nobody likes paying a bill. Especially not the electricity bill and not the, 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 the rest of the bills you have to pay. The phone bill is not so big. But, you know, the electricity bill, that sometimes is a big bill. Who wants to pay it? But you know what? Can you do anything about it? Next month you'll get another one. And the following month you'll get another one. Can you get rid of it? You already came to terms that this bill is always going to come in the mail whether you like it or not. But you already came to terms that, okay, it's part of life. So problems in my life, it's part of life. Now I want to focus how can I be happy. Because when you are happy and the, the, the scenery of the world is shining, then the difficulties are not, that's not, not so bad. Now how do I really get serious true happiness? Is when the light of my soul is being revealed in the body. If the light of my soul is not revealed, then by default I'll be sad, I'll be depressed, I'll be moody, I'll have anxiety, I'll have fear, and so forth. The problem is that we're constantly being bothered by external excitements, and we think that that's what's going to bring me my happiness. A nicer car, a nicer phone, the new edition of the phone, a bigger car, a bigger house, a nicer vacation. So these external disturbances that most people think that's going to cause them happiness, but it doesn't cause happiness. It's actually just causing problems. Now, the way Hashem created the world is, I explained that yesterday more in length, and you can find many lectures online that I explained that, but there is a relationship in this world between two entities that are called a light and a vessel, or and kli. Everything that you want to contain has to be, a, 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 that you want to hold has to be contained by a certain vessel. If you want to drink something, you need a cup. You want to ha a, a, you have money, you want to put it in the bank account, the bank account is the vessel, has to hold the money. If you have a check, a million dollar check, and there's no bank account, what are you going to do with this check? So everything in this world has a relationship between a light, light means a giver, and the vessel is a receiver. And God created us. As a vessel, we are constantly here to receive God's light. And the way God programmed the world is that we have to be creatures of happiness and pleasure. That's how He created us. By default, we are made to be happy and to have pleasure from everything. Now we're in exile, so it's a little bit of a problem. 
but my nature, my human nature is to run after pleasures all the time. And where the pleasure can be meals, the pleasure can be a vacation, whatever it is. But I'm constantly looking for some type of a pleasure. Now, when I don't have pleasure in my life, when I'm not happy in my life, then I'm seeking it. And where do I find the answers to it? In instant gratifications. I, will no, I don't find it in deeper things. I look for instant gratifications. But that's fake, and it doesn't give me real happiness. Now, the way Hashem made it is that if I broke my own vessel, I'll explain very soon what I mean, is that I will continue breaking the rest of my vessels like a chain reaction of negativity. If I did one problem, then I will continue going the same path. That's how Hashem created it. And I'll explain very soon what I mean. The problem is that I have to understand that anything that's coming from an, the, an external part will never help. And the external parts, if I have to deal with some type of a problem, some people go to alcohol, some people will go to pills, some people will go to, I don't know, stick their head in front of a screen like this for three hours. Just let me forget about the, the, the world right now. These are all sorts of external things. Most people, they don't have the right tools how to deal with the difficulties in their life, so they shut down because it's too much for them to deal with it. So unfortunately, in our generation, there are many external things that help you shut down. And it goes from anywhere from drugs, narcotics, alcohol, gambling, and many other things that you just shut down because you don't know how to deal with it. Not you don't want to, you just don't know how to deal with it. But that never works. It never works and it will never will work. The way the system works is that God has no interest of you suffering. This is a misconception. A lot of people say, why does God want me to suffer? God, if you would have a personal conversation with him, he won't tell you, I want you to suffer. He will tell you, I'm not looking for you to suffer. Maybe you did a reaction, a certain action that will cause you a reaction to suffer. Or you did something wrong. When you buy a brand new car, you are expecting the car to run smooth. Something goes wrong with the car, a light will go on. Oh, why did the light go on? So you can go into the dealer so they can tell you, there's a problem in the engine, there's a problem in the brakes. Can you get upset at the light that went on? No, the light is guiding you to go and fix it. So when I suffer, it means God is telling me other words. Something's wrong, go and fix it. You're doing something wrong. God has no intention for you to suffer. And you have to take it out of your mind because many people are saying, why is God doing it to me? Don't blame God for anything. He's actually helping you. So the way it works is that God... We call him in many different names, and one of the names that we call him is the infinite light, or and sof. Now, many people translate it to a light bulb. Oh, God is like a light bulb. But God is not a light bulb. That's not what he's talking about. This light, it means a, a shefa, an abundance. You can call it an energy. You can call it however you want to. But God is constantly on the giving side. And he's giving an abundance of blessing and, and, and much more than what we can handle. We are the ones who are limiting how much I can get. Because if I have a very expensive wine, I want to give you the wine to drink from, and I pour it into your cup, right away you have to pull out a cup. If you don't give me a cup, then the wine will spill over the floor. Same analogy God is giving you constantly. If you don't pull out a cup, then you can't grab the blessing. Now sometimes you pull in a very small cup, so you can only take this much, but I want to give you a whole bottle. And again, everything will be poured on the floor. Same analogy, God is constantly giving you a blessing. Livelihood, parnasa, happiness, health, everything. Either you're not handing out a vessel to grab it, or your vessel is broken, cracked, and it's all spilling out, or the vessel is way too small and you're not able to hold this abundance. So the problem is in the receiver, not in the giver. So first and most important is to negate the thought that God is not, doesn't want to give you a blessing, or He hates you, or he's one, He wants to torture you. Rather, the problem is on the receiving end. If I want to give something to my child, but he doesn't want to come to take it, that I, want to give, I can want as much as I want. So, the creator of the world is an infinite light. The light is an abundance of wealth, happiness, success, everything that you need. We need the right vessels to receive this light, to hold the capacity of this blessing. One example out of many, I can give now my child a hundred thousand dollar check. Not that I have a hundred thousand, I'm just giving an analogy. 
And I can also give my child a 30 cents lollipop. Which one do you think he's going to like the most? You think the child is going to look at the $100,000 check and say, thank you so much, I'm going now to open a bank account with that. The child will throw the check out of my hand and take the 30 cents lollipop because it's shiny and it's red and it tastes good on his tongue. Why is he doing that? Because the capacity, the key, the vessel to understand that the $100,000 check is much more valuable, he doesn't understand that. He understands that the 30 cent lollipop that has a little bit of taste on it because it has sugar, that's the good thing. That's the problem with us, is that our vessel is not wide enough to understand that what God wants to give me is much greater than what I can handle. I go to little small things that I think, oh, that's going to make me happy right now. That's the, the lollipop analogy. So I have to understand that God constantly wants to give me an abundance. I am the one that either is not pulling out a vessel to hold it, or my vessel is broken. You break a vessel, I'll explain in a second a little bit more. A broken vessel is when you make sins, when you do sins. That's why it says in the Torah what not to do. So if I go and lie, or cheat, or slander, or say Lashon or I do many other sins in the book, this is what will break my vessel. Now a lot of people say, listen, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very observant. Yeah, but who says that you're, you can be 99% observant and do one sin? Most people don't even know that some of the sins, they might look very, very small, but they're very, very big. I mean, we have a serious problem in our generation and in every congregation and community that everybody hates each other. That's called sinat chinam, just hating another, purpose, another person for no reason. That's a severe sin. You can have a long beard and pray three times a day and observe Shabbat and eat kosher and give charity. But if you hate another person, then you know what happens? You're making, you puncture a hole at the bottom of the well. And same thing with many other things, being judgmental, have jealousy. No, jealousy is a sin. Lying, a lot of people lie all the time, and so forth. The analogy that I like giving is that not too long ago, we have Baruch Hashem uh, in, our, in our center in Tzfat, we have these massive, massive Shabbat meals. Hundreds of people come from all over the world, we have beautiful Beautiful meal, all home, home cooked, all healthy food, beautiful atmosphere, singing, dancing, eating, amazing Shabbat. Okay, with that, we have to prepare for that. So our sages teach us that it doesn't matter who you are or what you are, you also participate in, in, uh, in uh, uh, preparing for the Shabbat. So we have these huge water urns that we keep the hot water for Shabbat. One Shabbat, I put one of them under the tap, I open the water to start filling it up. Now it takes about 5-10 minutes to fill it up. It's a big, 150 liters. Okay, so in the meantime I go do other things. I come back after a few minutes, I look inside the water, it didn't even go up. Okay, I go out, I do a few more other things, come back after a few minutes, I look inside, nothing up. It went up like maybe a little like this. Okay, I go out, I do a few more things, I come back. What's going on here? The water level is not moving. What's going on? We're going crazy here. The water is already pouring in for 10 minutes. Why is the water level not going up? And then I noticed that on the other side, that black you know, hook where you turn it down for the water, the faucet, to come down, it was stuck on the way down. So the water was going out constantly. So I was pouring water in, and on the other side, the water was going out, and it was not filling up the water. I was like, look at that. That's how, how we are. God pours in blessings into our life, and I do one little act. I lie, I cheat, I slander, and I make a punch, a, a, I poke a hole, and in the bottom, and all the blessing is just going out and going out, and I don't feel that I'm getting anything. So, we are the vessels to receive God's light. If there's going to be a crack in my vessel, then the light, the, the abundance will go out constantly. Now, I am, I am built, I'm built into my system with a desire to receive this blessing. It's not that I don't want to, just that I sometimes interpret it to be the wrong thing and I go and look for the pleasure somewhere else. The, the system, how it works, is the second that the vessel is empty, then I suffer. That's how it works. I can have millions of dollars, I can have everything I want, but if the vessel inside is empty, then right away I will suffer. The problem is that I right away direct the suffering to something that's happening in my life. Oh, I'm suffering because of this right now. But really I'm suffering because my vessel is empty. 
So I feel sad, I feel depressed, I feel not nourished, I feel no, I have no, no hope. And, and I'm looking, Something, somebody has to be blamed here. Oh, so it's because of the financial situation. Oh, because my wife is driving me crazy. Oh, because this is a problem, because my kid is doing this and that. I have to blame somebody. But the suffering is coming from within, why? Because my vessel is empty. Because I either cracked it or I either damaged it or there's not light going in there for whatever reason right now, we'll explain later. But that's, the that's why I will suffer. When the vessel is full of light, I'm happy, it doesn't matter what's going to happen, disasters around the world, I'll be with a smile on my face. And I always use the same example. I live in Sfat, I mentioned that already a few times. Beautiful city, gorgeous city, but unfortunately a very poor city. A lot of poor people there. But you look at people in the streets there, everybody's smiling, like everybody's walking like that. And not that they're like giving out in the entrance of the city something to inhale that everybody's like in some la-la land. But everybody's like, uh, everybody's just smiling there. So there's one guy that lives near, nearby I don't even know who he is. I, 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 I always see him driving around. He has a little bicycle. And he's happy, smiling. Oh, is he riding his bicycle? He waves like this to me, nods his head. I don't even know him. I nod back. And he looks like the most happiest person in the world, riding his bike. One time, we bumped into each other. How are you? We had a little quick conversation. And in this quick conversation, he told me, I'm sorry, I gotta rush to the bank. I gotta go to the bank before they close. I have to deposit some money. And in this two minute conversation, I don't even know why, he told me that he has a hundred thousand shekel debt to the bank. And I'm like, You have a hundred thousand shekel debt to the bank and you're constantly smiling? He's like, Yeah. And I was like, Why are you smiling? He's like, Because it's not two hundred thousand. <laughs> so, doesn't matter. A person can have a lot, a lot of problems. But if inside, the vessel, the soul is happy. It's challenges are like, okay, it will come, it will go, it will come, it will go, it will pass, or whatever. I have control over it. I don't have a control over it. Do I have control over anything here? I have zero control of anything. Not on my financial situation, not on my health situation, no, nothing. I need to do some type of effort to change it. But don't think for one second you have control and you can do anything that will make something change, it's all up to Hashem. Your challenge is how do you deal with the situation? Do you deal with it with a smile or do you suffer? So we don't want to suffer. The challenges will stay there. We just don't want to suffer. We want to be at least happy and content. Now, Rabbi Akiva, one of our greatest sages, explained that there's a Metsuda Prusa. Metsuda is like a net. Like uh, some net is hovering over me. Like, you know, when you want to catch a fish, you put a net in the water and you lift it up. So we have some type of a net above us that it's like a trap. And it's above us for our entire life. Metsuda pusa malarosh. Always there's like a net. What is this trap? That I'm constantly swinging between suffering and pleasure. Suffering, pleasure. This is these two motives here that I want to have pleasure, I want to be happy, and on the other hand, I'm suffering, pleasure, suffering. Now, the rule is that if there's suffering in my life, then I'm walking on the wrong path. The suffering is an indication that I'm doing something wrong. And God is telling you, listen, I can either give you all the information right now, but you have no reward, or there's no gain here, or I don't give you any information, but you have to find it out by yourself. And that's part of our challenge. But the reality is that God will give you the cold, hot game. You go in the wrong direction, hot, 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 cold, cold, cold. So the challenges in our life is this hot, cold game. And if I'm suffering in my life, it means I'm not going on the right path. Something's, something's wrong. I have to change something. And Avraham Avinu, he says that the source of the suffering of human beings is the fact that they lack something. If I'm suffering, then I'm lacking something. And it doesn't mean that I'm lacking the newest iPhone that just came out. That's not what I'm talking about. That's this physical instant gratification that is meaningless. That that's what people run after, thinking that will change something in their life. That's actually what causes all the problems. 
But Avraham Avinu, this is the teachings of our father Avraham Avinu, that says the source of suffering of human beings is the fact that they lack something. What do they lack? Ah, do you lack anything in your life? You have a house, you have a car, you have clothes, you have a fridge, you can open the fridge, eat whatever you want, whenever you want, you have a phone, you can communicate with people. Now comes the question, does it matter what phone you have? As long as you can communicate. So it's the X, the S, the R, who cares? What does it matter? So the camera's a little bit better. But we're not lacking anything. So how come we're suffering? Because obviously we're lacking something. Now, if I don't have what I want, then I suffer. That's how it is. Like a little kid, if I have what I want, everything's good. If I don't have what I want, then I start suffering. Now here I'm not going to talk about if I don't have the newest iPhone or the nicest car or whatever, then I suffer. That's already very childish and immature. But if I don't have a good relationship with my wife and we constantly fight, that's not what I want, then I suffer. Or my health is not to the level that I would want it to be, then I suffer because I want to have good health. I want to have a good relationship. I want my kids to follow me like that. It doesn't work like that. I also want my kids to do certain things. I already see that my kids are not following the path exactly where I'm going. I'm already coming to terms that my kids are not carbon copy of me, even though I would want to. But they're individuals, and they have to go on their path. My kids are still young. I'm praying for Mashiach to come every day just that I don't have to deal with teenagers. <laughs> so... Everybody has a reason why they pray for Mashiach. One wants to shalom, be healthy, another one wants to have uh, the, his uh, problems uh, aside. I pray Mashiach should come. I don't want to deal with teenagers. But nevertheless, when I don't have what I want, then I suffer. This is the rule. And this works for everything. Very, very few people don't care if they don't get what they want. Most people, when they don't get what they want, it will come right away as suffering. Now, the reason why God created suffering in the world, one can ask, if God is such a great God, why did He create suffering? Well, God created many bad, bad things in this world, but why did He create suffering? To teach you how to come to a better place. Because if there wouldn't be two realities, how would you appreciate the good reality? It has to be also a bad reality. So the suffering in the world is for you to learn how to come to a place of a better place. That's the reason for suffering in the world. Now, as I said before, happiness is only coming from within. If you think anything external will cause happiness, then you're wrong. And like I said before, and I'm going to repeat it a few more times tonight, if you think you have any control of any situation, you're wrong. You don't have any control. You have uh, the means to change and to add, but you have no control. Now, of course, there comes a big question. So if I have no control, why should I do anything? But you're right. You shouldn't do anything. You should do what you're supposed to do. Let God take over the rest of the problems. And many, many times the challenge, the problem that I have is, I told you, is the step to grow. Sometimes always requires patience. Just be patient. Let Hashem deal with it. Not too long ago, a lady, she was uh, asking me some questions, and she was telling me that she's about to go on a date. And, ooh, a whole week, she's telling me I can't sleep. I'm, I'm, why? Why can't you sleep? I don't know. I don't know if I like him. What if I like him and he doesn't like me? What if he likes, I like him, he likes me and I don't like him? What if it's this? What if it's that? And I'm like, did you go already on the date? <laughs> no. So what do you worry about? Go on the date. No, I, a whole week I'm not sleeping. But what if he likes me and I don't like him? Okay, but what if? You still have this what if question. The point was that she was going backwards and forth and not eating, not sleeping, not, uh, not being at ease. And I told her, why don't you go on the date? Let's see what happens. And then we'll ask some questions. And what do you think happened? She went on the date and she calls me two minutes later. I don't like him. Okay, so you got your answer. So why did you have to suffer for a whole week? worrying what's going to happen. Why don't you let the course of nature happen, see what God is dishing out for you, and deal with it on the spot. Why do you worry about something that 99% most likely will never happen? 
That's this what if. Why do you worry? Most people worry about something that the major, the, the highest chances, it will never even happen. So I feed into it. So I have to understand that the happiness, true happiness is coming only from within. It's not coming from anything external. It's only coming from my soul, programmed and telling me to be happy. Now, when am I happy? When is my soul happy? Is when I get what I want. When I get what I want, then, I, then I'm happy. Right? If I don't have what I want, then I'm not happy. Now, the problem is that I want things that I can't get. That's where the problem starts. And again, um, you can take it to something very superficial that I want the newer model that came out for the iPhone or a newer car or a bigger house. And, but I can't get it because I don't have money. Right? Yeah, so what does it help me that I want it? The majority of our problems are is that we want things that we know that we will never be able to get. And that's the problem of most people. And it trickles to the department of jealousy. How come he has more money than me? How come they have a better relationship than me and my wife? How come his kids are more polite than my kids? That's the problem, that most people are looking and they, they want something that they will never get. Sometimes it's just enough to come to terms that I will never get this. It will never happen. Get it out of your imaginary, get it out of, out of your fantasy. You'll never get it. So you need to know when, it, when are things you're going to get and you're going to have. And some things when you know this I will never have, why even think about that? And if Hashem wants me to have it, I will have it regardless. What's the point of running after something that I will never, never have? And some cases, when it comes to challenges, there's no black and white because what I'm saying now is very, very broad. Because sometimes the challenge is a financial challenge and uh, it could be that it's written in your books that you will never have money. That your whole life is going to be about financial difficulties. Why? Because Hashem wants to test you about trust in Him. That you trust Him from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. That's it. End of story. You'll never have money. You have to come to terms with that. Sometimes a person says, listen, I don't have a good relationship with my wife. Well, come to terms with that. You'll never have a good relationship with her. Because that's the challenge that you have. Not because you're mean, not because you're bad, not because you're incapable. Because this is the challenge. How you can live your life and, uh, and, and have uh, uh, the right... Uh, the right attitude to deal with a challenge like marriage that will never, doesn't mean that you have to get divorced. Who said that said you have to get divorced? A divorce, that's it. Something doesn't work out right away to get divorced. Maybe that's your challenge. So you think you're going to get rid of this wife, so you'll get another wife, they will have another problem. <laughs> so the, the idea that I'm trying to paint is that sometimes if there's a certain challenge that I need to deal with throughout my life, I can't get rid of it. That is what Hashem gave me to work on. And each and every one of us has a list of problems, what I need to deal with. There's a joke that there was an individual that lived his life, very long life, 90 years old, was observant. He did every mitzvah in the Torah. He didn't miss one thing. He was courteous and loving and God-fearing and charitable and everything that you can just imagine, that's what he did. But unfortunately, he had the worst life ever never had money his kids turned against him his wife was driving him crazy sicknesses problems his life was a living hell and how does he end his life one day he walks down to the road and a car runs him over and kills him he goes up to the heavens it's a joke don't worry don't don't take it so serious it's a joke <laughs> he goes up to the heavens sits an angel there and he bangs on the table and he says i want to see god i want to see the boss the angel says, whoa, 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 you just, going, just don't go into the boss like that. Like, whoa, what's your case? Why do you want to see him? He tells him, listen, I did every little thing it said in the Torah. Every little thing. And look at my life. Stinky life. Nothing worked out. Everything was wrong. Everything was bad. I wanna, I'm demanding explanations. Okay, relax. We'll take you to the boss. They take him into the, to the office of God. God tells him, no, how can I help you, Mr. Feinstein says, listen, I'm not happy. I did everything it said in the Torah, everything you told me to do. I was super Jew. But look how much I suffered. And I had health problems and financial problems and marital problems. And it's not fair. God tells him, what do you want? He's like, I want to go back again to this world. And I want to have a near-death experience. 
and I want to have a YouTube channel with a lot of videos. <laughs> he says, I want to go back down to this world and I want you to give me a good life. I'm not asking much, a good life. So God says, okay, I will grant you your wish. You can go back. But you have to understand that everybody in this world has to have problems. Everybody. There's no such a thing that somebody comes to this world and doesn't have problems. But I will give you a bonus. You can choose your own problems. Ooh. I like that. No problem. He tells him, go to the end of the corridor. There's a door. Knock on the door. An angel will open the door. Tell him that I sent you. And he will guide you where to choose your own problems. The happy man runs down the corridor, finds the door, knocks on the door. A nice angel opens the door. tells him, listen, God sent me here. And he told me to choose my own problems. The angel says, okay, what's your name? What's your social security number? No problem. And he says, go in to the warehouse. This is the warehouse of problems. He walks into the warehouse. It looks like a Home Depot, 40 feet tall, long corridors, these big, big, big uh, 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 shelves. All the shelves are full of sacks, bags. Some bags are big, some bags are small, some bags are, are like this and like that. And the man tells him, what is this place? The angel tells him, this is the warehouse of problems. Everybody in the world owns here a bag. You can go and choose whichever bag you want. No problem. He tells him, do I have a time limit? No, take your time. This is heaven. There's no time up here. He starts running up and down the corridors, the aisles, and he's looking for moving all the bags, and he's looking for the smallest bag he can find. Finally, after hours of a search, he sees like a little bag and in the back, like sticked in the back behind a big bag and he moves all the bags and he pulls out this little, little bag. He runs to the angel and he tells him, I want this one, this one. Angel says, no problem, let's write down, Teet, scans the, 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 the bag, sign over here, go back to God. He goes back to God, oh, happy with the bag and he's, he's all excited and he tells God, yeah, I found a bag, I found a bag and God looks at it and says, oh, that, that's the bag you had before. So, the thing is that we all come down to this world with a bag of problems. It's just that we have to understand that the problem is not the source of my misery. The problem is, is for me to deal with, and there's many reasons for that. We're not going to talk about tonight why and how, and I want to talk about tonight how do I stay happy. My, my suffering or my happiness has nothing to do with my problems. If I attach my happiness to my problems, then it's a problem. Because my happiness is not depending on my problems. My happiness is depending on my soul. If my soul is satisfied, then it will be happy. That's how it works. Now, like I said before, that we usually go after things that we don't have. We want things that I will never get. And I have to come to terms with understanding that this I will never have. That I will never have. And when I'm running after things that I know that I will never have, or at least I'm, I have the idea, then I will never be happy. I have a friend who, about maybe 15 years, he was trying to be the next Facebook. He came out with any idea that came out, and he fundraised, and he got money, any startup you can think of, all the software applications, he wanted to make it big. Every time he would come to me, I have an amazing idea, and I'm like, oh, what now? No, don't ask, it's an app, and he's going to do this, going to do that, and I don't worry, he's going to make 10, he's giving me all the fantasies of money, and never worked out. You know, the idea was, the funny part was that his ideas were good. But nothing worked out. Nothing ever worked out. After a while, I told him, no, not to uh, disappoint you, but I don't think you meant to do it good, big in this department. Yeah, I don't think Hashem is ever going to let you be the next Facebook or even anything successful. And I told him, you know what? You have such a talent to give over Torah. He was so smart. I told him, how I look at you, Hashem wants you to, to learn Torah. And to teach Torah. Ah, no, 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 it's not for me. Fifteen years he was trying to make business. The joke is that in one of the times that he was trying to make a business, one time he came and he was like, can you borrow me some money? And I'm like, of course, how much do you need? So I borrowed him some money. And of course that business didn't work out. 
And, uh, and he kept telling me, listen, one day I'll have money, I'll have money. And at some point I told him, you know, I just wrote it off. Don't, don't worry about it. It wasn't a big amount, but I was like, okay, I tried to help you, whatever. And every time he would come, no, no, one day I'll have money, one day I'll have money, I'll give you money. Okay, I didn't hear from him for many years. One day, last year, I get a phone call. Hi, how are you? Ooh, how are you doing? He says, listen, I have money now. What is your bank account? I want to put the money right now in your bank account. Ooh, that came exactly at the time that I was wandering in the universe. I needed a certain amount of money. I was like, where is the money going to come from? Out of the blue, a debt from 10 years suddenly comes. Hashem has uh, the solutions to all the problems. Very good. So he deposits the money in the account. Everything's good. I told him, oh, no, so I understand. If you have money now, you finally made it. He's like, no, don't. I gave up about two years ago. I sit and learn Torah all day long in a kolel. I'm so happy. I got married. I have two beautiful daughters. I learned Torah all day long. I've never been so happy. <laughs> and I told him, you schmuck for 15 years. You couldn't listen to me that I told you that, oh. that you're running after, after dreams. Mm -hmm. So I have to come to terms very quickly in my reality what is my reality and what is fiction and what is dreams and what will never, never happen and what will happen and what I can have some type of a control. Now, the thing is that I have to understand and remember that whatever I need, God gives me. God gives me everything that I need. I'm not lacking anything. I think that I lack something because I want a nicer home or a bigger car or a better vacation. That doesn't mean that I need it. Shem will give me exactly what I need. And if I'm lacking something, maybe I'm the problem that my vessel, my capacity of holding it, is not equipped for that. And like I told you before, the human suffering is coming from a deficiency, that something is missing in my life. Now, if I want something that I don't need, then most likely I will never get them anyways. How many people say, oh, I'm dreaming on one day going on Kosherika and being on a cruise and a... keep on dreaming, you're never going. <laughs> My wife always tells me, oh, maybe one day, I told her, no, no, no day. And she's like, why don't you let me dream? Because it's not going to happen. I'm not taking you on Kosherika. If I had that amount of money, I will feed a hundred families. So if you know it's not, it's not ever coming, why do you want to dream of something that will never, never happen? You have to be with your feet on the ground. So, when I want something that I don't need, that's even worse, that causes this emptiness, that I want something that I don't really need. Do I really need that nicer phone or the nicer, I don't really need it. You know, I lived four years in, in Tzfat, I don't even have a car. People tell me, you don't have a car? I don't have a car, I don't need it. I use, whenever I need, I use a taxi. The amount of money that I spend on taxis is a fraction of what I would use on gas, insurance, and, and the maintenance of a car. Why do I need a car? To worry to park it? Because to say I have a car. So I'll go on the bus. I walk. It's a small city. And I don't need, if I don't need it, why do I need to walk? Now I need to worry about holding a car and paying for it and taking it to the garage like a, like a dog to the veterinar. Why do I need to worry about a car? Let somebody else worry about a car. I'll go into a taxi. Now you have Uber, Schmuber, all this. Chick chuck, everything is easy. I don't have to worry about parking. Don't have to worry about anything. So when I want something that I don't need, that causes in me even a greater suffering. So what is the solution? We want a solution. To understand the, the, the theory is nice, but what is the solution? The solution is don't want. <laughs> don't, don't want anything. Don't desire anything. Wait for Shem to give to you what you deserve. Now this is not so easy. What, I don't, shouldn't have any dreams or any desires or any requests? Then, yeah, you shouldn't. Say to Hashem, Hashem, give me what I need. I need to be healthy, give me health. I need to have money, give me money. When you are humbling yourself to a point that you're saying, Hashem, you just give me what I need. You want me to have an amazing uh, a wife? Give me an amazing wife. If I have in the books, it says that I have to have a challenge of a bad marriage, then it's going to happen one way or another. Like I told you before with the, dream, with the, with the joke, with the sack of problems. Yesterday we had a class about reincarnations and I was explaining there that we all have to go through a certain path and it will take a few lifetimes to do it. And in one lifetime I will be rich, you'll be poor. In a different lifetime we'll come back together, you'll be rich, I'll be poor. And it will constantly change and I have to go through a circle through everything. 
One time I have to be rich, one time I have to be poor. One time I have to be happy, one time I have to be sad. One time I'm going to have a good marriage, one time I'm going to have a bad marriage, and so forth. This, everybody has to go through the same path. And the reason why we all have to go through the same path is that no soul can come to God and say, if you would give me that person's life, I would be a much better person. That way God says, no, you all got the same chance. You all got the same challenges, just it coming in different times. So sometimes you're looking and says, ah, look at that person, everything goes well. These kids are so good, and he has, he has parnasa, and this and that, and this is the wrong thing to do, because in a different time it was switched, and you were in that person's place, and that person was in your place. Don't look at another person and say, ah, I wish I had that, that his kids. Ah. Sometimes people come and, 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 and I hate it, tell me, ah, oh, your kids are so polite. Shh, don't look at my kids now. Hey. Why? Because we all have to deal with something at one point or another. So what is the, what is the solution? It's not to want, not to ask, not to desire. It's just to let Hashem do His thing. How do you do it? That's already not a simple thing to do. Because the Yetzirah is always going to corner me to a point that I'm doing something that I don't want. And not too long ago I saw something so interesting to emphasize what I'm trying to say is that you know how they hunt monkeys in Africa? You would think they would, I don't know why they hunt them to start with, but nevertheless, you know how they hunt them? They make like these little boxes with a little hole and that a hand can fit inside. But they put in the box a big piece of salt. Now, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but the monkeys, they love the salt. Now, the monkey will come and put the hand in, and then he will grab the chunk of the salt. Now he comes to pull the hand out, and he can't, because the hand is like this. And then the hunter will come and just take the man, don't have to do anything. And you would think, no, dear monkey, leave the, leave the thing of the salt and run out. But they're... <laughs> They don't understand. They want the salt. They want something they can't have. They lose their life, but they're holding the salt. It's just something interesting that I saw how they hunt these monkeys there. Same thing with us. I'm holding on something, and I don't understand. The Yetzirah has grabbed me here, and now I'm in a completely bad situation. Let go! Let go! Let go of what you're holding. You'll see you'll be free. We don't know how to let go. So when I'm asking myself, how can I remain happy when life is hard, is you let go. Let go of what you're holding on. Don't worry. Don't put yourself in a situation that you are under stress and anxiety and worrying of something that you can't, you have zero control over it. If something has to happen, it will happen whether you want it or not. And you have zero control over it. And I know it's sad, but if a person has to suffer for something, and unfortunately we see unbelievable suffering in front of us, but if that's what is decreed on that person, it will happen. So in the meantime, at least put a smile on your face. You know why? Because at least in the time being, why should you suffer? Besides the fact that the happiness, the simcha, our sages say, simcha poretz gadel. The simcha, the happiness, can break any barrier. Any type of barrier, any type of problem, you know how you overcome it? With a smile. But a real smile, not a fake smile. Don't look for fake things. Look for the real happiness. And the real happiness is when the soul is content. When the soul is a good, clean vessel to receive the abundance of Hashem, then you're happy. So you're like that uh, neighbor of mine. He's happy. He knows there's a debt. He says, one day it will be over. I'm doing payments. One day it will be over. So I'll have three years of stress. Why should I be unhappy in the meantime? And you know what his answer was? I'm happy it's not 200,000 because then it will be double to pay it. So I have a problem. I have to pay it. It will be paid. But in the meantime, why should I better be affected from that? You know that most diseases are coming to people because they're unhappy. Because they're miserable. Because they have fears and anxieties and worry and jealousy and hate. You know, most of the Problems that see people suffer from is because they hate another person for no reason, because they're jealous of another person. Jealousy and hate and feelings of animosity and anger towards another person. This is the source of all diseases. 
You know how many people get severe diseases because somebody did to them something 40 years ago and they're holding grudge for 40 years? Let go! Let go! You'll see that all the problems will disappear. Not too long ago I met this man who told me, I don't talk to my brother. 40 years! 40 years! Why, what did he do to you? Did he murder your kids? No. When he invited me to his, grand, to his son's bar mitzvah, he sat me in that table, not in that table. Are you out of your mind? 40 years you do not talk to your brother because he sat you somewhere else? And needless to say, probably what hardship and ulcer and, and diseases and because you hate another person? Because somebody did to you something 40 years ago? And even if somebody did something to you two days ago, Somebody not too long ago, I told you we have these big Shabbat tables, and sometimes well, there's a lot of actions. My kids love it because all the characters that come, is, oh, we have a lot of actions in these Shabbat meals. It's not like a typical Shabbat meal that you sing a few songs and, uh, and I give a little bit of Torah. There's action there. And there's usually a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. Anyway, somebody, somebody did something, and one night they created a whole big thing, and, and somebody came and told me, how come you don't get upset at this uh, individual? And I told him in a not nice way, in a harsh way, you have to excuse my language, I said, I don't let the stupidity of other people affect me. If somebody else is behaving in a stupid way, why should it affect me? I need to be upset. I need to worry. I need to be in fear. I need to have hate or anger because somebody else is behaving in a ridiculous way. Why should I let somebody else affect me? So we don't understand that a lot of the problems, I cook to myself the own problem. And the trick here, like I told you, the way to carry this happiness is don't want anything. A lot of people, you know, like I told you before, they don't fall asleep because they want. I want this, I want that. Don't want. And how do you don't want? Is just let go. Let go. Let Hashem drive. When Hashem runs the show, He runs the show how He wants to run the show. And you're just sitting there and enjoying the ride. If you think you can take the wheel in some type of a way and have some type of control, you can't. And then you get full of, of sadness and, and anxiety because you think you are the one who are doing something or you have control. Chas v'shalom, you get bad news and the doctor tells you something, chas v'shalom, you think you have any control? Yes, you want to do tshuva. I mean, I told you the suffering is for me to put me back on the right path. And so Sam will put some type of a suffering, uh, some type of affliction that I have to, to wake up. But, don't forget for one second that constantly we're going to have another challenge and another challenge and another challenge. It doesn't end. Sometimes I talk to young people and they tell me, you know, I have challenges now because I'm young. No, you're going to have challenges also when you're old. I told you already, we have the, the ladies center that we have is for mature women. We have a yeshiva for older men. Men that became observant or converted or never got the chance to learn. Our oldest student is 84 years old. An 84-year-old man that comes every day to learn Torah. And all the students there are old, older. I'm, I'm like a little kid next to them. <laughs> all with white beards in their 60s, 50s, 70s. And I tell the young ones, well, you think the ones in the 80s that come to learn, they don't have challenges? They also have challenges. But you think that you turn your, your, your age from 60 to 70 to 80, there's no challenges? There's challenges till the last breath of your life, there's going to be a challenge. Till the last moment you're going to breathe, there's going to be problems. The problems don't uh, stop. They just change. One day is this, one day is that. You just need to say, my problems are not my problems. This is Hashem's problem. Let Hashem deal with it. I have to deal with what I have to deal with. And the best way of doing it is to understand that I have no control. Just, you let go. When you let go, when you don't want anything, you say, Hashem, you give me what I need. And I'm not saying not to pray, not to do anything. A lot of people say, so, babe, so why do I need to pray? You still need to pray because if Chas Shalom there's a decree, you want it to be changed. And you want to do actions, you want to give charity, you want to become uh, more observant and closer to Hashem, and whatever you need to do. That's not what I'm talking about right now. You don't become completely passive. But you put everything into Hashem's hands, because He's the one in control. And I can tell you, this is, I can tell you from my own experience, guarantee that the second that you ignore the problem, 90% of the challenge, is, it wears off. It, things work out. And things pass, the periods pass, thing happens, and you, okay, so it was a bad period, we had to deal with it. 
If you're looking at it as something bad, then it pulls you down. If you're looking at it as an opportunity, then it's a stepping stone to jump to a higher place. And in most cases, you look back and you'll be like, wow, you know what? I now see why it had to be so bad. You know, many, many years ago, not many, I'm not saying I'm a dinosaur, but about 12 years ago, my son, he was two years old and he was uh, very, very clumsy. And one time uh, I, I, I was sitting, I had a little office in my basement. And one time he was walking like with this little uh, stroller and he fell down the stairs and he rolled down the stairs. I couldn't do anything as far away. I heard my wife screaming, oh my God. And I'm like, you know, you see something happen, you can't do anything. Anyways, I ran to him, he was crying and my wife ran down freaking out. I pick him up and right away I start touching his head to see chas v'shalom, something happened. There wasn't any blood. But as I was touching his head, I put my hand in the back of his head and I feel a bump. Move the hairs. He was two and a half years old, so it was a lot of hair. I moved the hair and right here in the back of the head was a tick. Oh, probably was playing around in the outside in the park or something and he had a tick right over here. You know how dangerous the ticks are? In a person can get Lyme disease. This is, you're stuck with it for almost your whole life. Right away, of course, we took him to the doctor. The doctor pulled it out, burnt the whole area, and Baruch Hashem, everything ended up perfect and good. And when you think about it, when you see him falling down the stairs, you think, what a tragedy, what a problem, why did it happen? I'm not a responsible parent. Uh, and that's what my wife was saying. What kind of parents are we? We don't have a gate on this, and how oh, I didn't look at him. And she was so hard on herself, and I told her, look at that. He had to fall because we had to find out that there's a tick in the back. If he wouldn't fall, we would never find that tick. Chas v'shalom, what could have been, what could have been if we wouldn't take it out? So Hashem staged a situation of a tragedy in order for us to be aware of a problem that we will never be aware of. And like this, if you're looking at things in your life, how many times the situation is bad, and then it saves you from a worse situation if you open your eyes and you want to see how the Kadosh Buhu is manipulating or maneuvering the situation, sometimes just let go, step back and let Hashem do His thing. You'll see that in most cases of your life, the Kadosh Buhu leads you to a place you think it's bad, it's actually the best thing ever. And now I like giving a new example because my, my brother-in-law and, and his wife, they made Aliyah not too long ago. Now he's a lawyer, and she's a physician assistant. Lawyers, Baruch Hashem, we have a lot in Israel, but physician assistant, there's no such a job in Israel. There's no such a position in Israel, no such a thing. So she doesn't, can't find a job. She's not a nurse, she's not a doctor, she's in the middle. So for months, she can't find a job, and she started becoming upset and depressed. Why did we do Aliyah? What a, what a mistake. And months, at some point, her son, their son became sick. Went to the doctor, didn't help, became more sick, more sick, more sick, couldn't find a solution. Went from this doctor to that doctor, coming very worried, what are we going to do? At some point they went to a specialist, and uh, they finally get to the doctor, and they don't speak Hebrew, so they speak with the doctor in English. A very short conversation, the doctor finds out that there are Olim Chadashim, they made Aliyah. He asks her, what do you do? She tells him, a physician assistant, oh, I need an assistant! He hires her on the spot. <laughs> and there's no such a job even in Israel. He just needed an assistant. So I said, look at that. You know, you, look, you can look at seven, month, seven months of hardship and no job and no money. And then the kids get sick. She, they were running from doctor to doctor. They were so worried, so full of anxiety. And I told her, look how God led you to the job you needed to get. And if you would not worry, first of all, the, the, you will get to the same place. But at least you would get it with a smile. Relax, happy. Content, not worry, no anxieties. Why do you have to let Hashem lead you where you need to go? And things are going to happen exactly how God wants them to happen. You can, can maybe pray to sweeten the judgment, but you, let, you have to let God do His thing. So when we want to conclude this, we have to understand that challenges are good for us. It's our step to jump to a higher level. You can look at it as an opportunity, and you can look at it as a punishment. If you look at it as a punishment, if you look at it as something bad, that's what you're going to deal with. If you look at it as an opportunity, you look where in that opportunity you can jump to a higher place. And God will open your eyes to show you what is the opportunity to bring you to a point to say, why was I worried the whole time? What a waste of time. 
What a waste of energy. What a waste of breath. So use the, the same attitude that I said, I don't let other people's behavior affect me. I fall asleep very fast because I say, why worry? What good would it do if I worry? Let Hashem worry. That's His problem. He created the problem. Let Him find a solution. I'll just do my part so I can at least know that I'm creating the right vessel to hold the blessing of Hashem. And you know what? Life without Mashiach, there's always going to be problems. There's going to be health problems. There's going to be financial problems. There's going to be marital problems. There's going to be constantly problems. Because God wants to put us on the right path and He also wants us to scream for Mashiach to already come. So the point to take from now is not necessarily the information that you heard tonight, is what do you do when you leave the door. This is the same spiel I will say in every lecture. To, to, to nod the whole night, everybody's nodding. I get a very good reaction with the nodding. <laughs> Yesterday I said the joke, it went very well. You know, Taco Bell had that dog that was uh, nodding. <laughs> so every time you would press the brakes, the dog will just uh, nod. So it's not, to nod is very, very nice. The point is, what do you do when you leave the door? If you leave the door and everything goes back to factory reset and, <laughs> and you forgot everything and you just came here and you enjoyed the beautiful sushi and the wine, then why did you come here? You wasted your time. So you want to at least come out with something from tonight. Unfortunately, I don't give souvenirs. You can take CDs, they're free. But there's no souvenirs. You have to take something from tonight. If you're already here, means that God already wanted you to hear what I have to say. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, bring you here for no reason. He brought you here so you can listen and say, you know what, maybe I can take one thing out of what I heard tonight and apply it into my life. If you're smart, that's what you do. If you leave the door tonight and nothing changed, then, then you, you didn't gain anything besides a full stomach. So you want to leave the door tonight by saying, okay, what can I apply into my life? then you want to apply into your life a change, an immediate change, that you have to understand that, that the challenge is, is good, it's not bad. The way to understand it, if you go now to the most fanciest gym in the world, you pay hundreds of dollars for your membership, if you're going to sit down on the bench like this, nothing will happen. You're not going to lose weight, you're not going to become stronger, you need to push and pull and push and pull, and it has to be with weight, it has to have resistance. There's no resistance. You can go like this as much as you want. It's not going to do anything. So the challenges is the resistance in my life. I have to push and that's how I develop growth. So I have to understand that the challenge is not a challenge. It's something good. It's good for me. I just have to see, open up my eyes where it's good for me. What's my growth here? I have to understand that I should not want and desire anything that doesn't belong to me or that I will never ever have. At some point in life, I have to come to terms, this will never change. And in some cases, it's hard to figure it out. In some cases, it's black and white. And you say, this will never change. I have a friend, has four kids recently. He, was, uh, 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 he had a fifth child born. Unfortunately, the child is born with Down syndrome. And in the beginning, the first maybe three, four years, the father and the mother, they, they were not functioning. Not, not functioning at all. And at some point I told them, listen, it's, don't look at it as a problem. Don't look at it as a curse. Don't look at it as a burden. Look at it as a blessing. And first of all, you have to come to terms, it's not going to change. There's no cure. There's no pill. Mashiach will come, it will change. But that's now the present that God gave you. Use it. It's a present. You seeing it as a tragedy. You seeing it as a curse. You seeing it as a burden. You seeing it as a problem. When God gave it to you, look at what's the, what's the blessing here. So it's not going to change. Come to terms. This is not going to change. That's the child. And if God gave it to me, it means that He wants me to deal with this neshama, with this soul. Use it to the best way possible. Don't look at why it's happening, and why me, and why God, and I'm such a good person, and I did this, and I did that. You're not going to get an answer. It's not going to change anything. That's the situation. Do the best out of the worst situation. So I have to understand that in my life, God will present me with situations that if I look through the clutter of the problem, that is the secret of my growth, how I can fulfill my purpose in this world. So I have to put my, my own desires aside, not to look for something that I will never have, to look for what is God telling me here? What is, what is the uh, opportunity that God is giving me? And to work around it. 
and to constantly remember that when I deal with a challenge but with a smile on my face, and I'm not saying it as a theory, I'm telling you I'm telling it from my personal experience, if I would tell you what I had to go through in the last 25 years, I can write 17 books of what I had to go through, and I'm not upset at anything, I see how every little thing took me to a much better place. And some of the challenges that I had to go through are devastating, but you know, Baruch Hashem, I always had the good attitude to keep a good, good attitude, good smile on my face and not to let it affect me. And you know why? Because I knew that that attitude will allow me to pass the challenge with much less problems, with much, le much, much less fear or much less pain or much less what to deal with. So why should I suffer in the meantime? If the road is bumpy, it's going to help me if I cry? No. Let's pass the road, be patient, have faith in Emuna and be Tachon in Hashem, and everything will turn out exactly how Hashem wants it to turn out. And I have to understand that I need to just to let go. Mezad Hashem, we're going to, we started with a, with a blessing and we'll end with a blessing that I wish you all that you're only going to experience happiness in your life, that everything that your heart desires should be blessed and be fulfilled in the best way possible, that anyone who needs to to have a good marriage will have a good marriage. Anyone who needs to have health should have strong health. Anyone who's struggling with parnasa should have great parnasa in their life and nachat from their kids. And really to shorten it, that everything that your heart desires that is exactly what Hashem wants for you should be fulfilled in the best way possible, both in the physical and the spiritual. Hashem should bless you all with great abundance of health and wealth and happiness. And I'm going to wish you already now, before Pesach already a happy and kosher Pesach. We always say at the end of the Haggadah, Lishana Ba Berushalayim. So we should say now Lishana Zot Berushalayim. Mezad Hashem should see you all in Yerushalayim with the coming of Mashiach. And hopefully we we'll always see you with a smile on your face.